Hello, everybody. This is the Working with Sensitivity Reader channel, as you all know, because you're all here on time. Um, some of you might have already been on panels already today. So if you haven't, I'll give you a quick rundown. I'm going to ask you some questions, and then the audience will hopefully have some questions for us. Dear audience, ask questions, please. You're allowed. Um, the first question is going to be that I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about your work. Um, we have lots of time, so don't feel like you have to cut yourself short for anything. Um, so we'll start with Natasha. Yeah, sure. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Natasha Lane. I'm a fantasy author, um, author of the Pariah Child series. Um, other information about me, I'm currently residing in D.C., though I'm expecting to move to the West Coast soon. Um, I've been working for as a sensitivity reader for about two years now. It's just kind of a side thing I do in contribution to like my regular writing and my day job. That's excellent. Um, what kind of writing do you do for when you're making your own work? Uh, fantasy writing. Oh, excellent. Even more excellent. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Lee Rossman. I'm from Binghamton, New York. My pronouns are she slash her. I am a disabled and queer and autistic writer of um, science fiction and fantasy. And I've edited two books with friends and I do occasional sensitivity readings for people usually re related to autism and disability. Excellent information um, and an excellent resource. It looks like we've lost Natasha briefly. Hopefully she'll be back in a second. Dan? Hi, I'm Dan Fitzgerald. I also am living in DC, so hi Natasha from across the city. Uh, I'm a recently uh, published for the first time fantasy author, and I work with a sensitivity reader on the second book coming in December uh, for LGBTQ representation, and I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. So we have people who do sensitivity reading, and so I'm going to lose my lamp. Someone who has used a sensitivity reader. Dear lamp. Um, I'm going to do my best. Tell me if I'm wrong. It is Emily. Uh, close. Uh, you can say Emmeline in English, but it's pronounced Emmeline in French. Emmeline? Emmeline Musso, yes. Cool. <laughs> I'll make it happen. Um, you can call me little... M or Emmy for the rest of the panel if you like. That's two of my <laughs> many nicknames. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us about yourself and your work. Well, I am a young adult middle grade writer, hopefully soon to be published novelist. Um, and sensitivity and beta reader living in South Florida. And I do this in addition, in addition to my day job. And I try to um, look at sensitivity reading from the lens of not just an American millennial, but also a Caribbean immigrant, because I feel that the lens of those living outside of the US is one that's often lacking in these types of conversations. Um, in my limited experience, um, I think that you're right and you provide a definitely some valuable insight for people. Um, we are going to, so the next question, um, Dan, you might have um, a good answer for this, but I think um, this one might be geared a little bit to more towards the others. How do you tell, um, whether it's your work or someone else's work, how do you know when you need a sensitivity reader? what should authors be looking out for that tells them they should seek out these services? Um, Jennifer, did you want to go first? Okay. Um, if you're writing from a perspective that is not anywhere near your own or about characters that are very different from you who often get stereotyped, um, it can be helpful then to think, is there a way that I'm interpreting their life that is based only on TV or movies instead of lived experience. Like I would not write about someone with a completely different disability and expect it correct. But yes, I don't know where I was going with that, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so anything outside of like someone's immediate exposure, anything that's it's, different from what they're used to? Especially if, people like that are often 
villainized or just like pitied like you wouldn't if you just base your perception of autistic people on the good doctor you're not going to be as respectful to autistic people as an actual autistic person could advise you to be we could have a whole panel on bad rep i think we could have a lot of fun on that um, Natasha, um, did you, um, did you want to elaborate on that? Did you want to add more? Um, yeah. When did you look for a reader? Mm, yeah. So I think that, I mean, there are many, re there are many reasons to have a sensitivity, sensitivity reader. I think for a lot of authors, it kind of comes into three main reasons. One being, if you have a cast of cast of characters who uh, do have a very li different, um, lived experience than you, then you probably need a sensitivity reader. Um, another one is if you're writing characters, um, characters of a different background than you, but you're writing them in POV, so they're going to have like chapters or sections of the of the manuscript from their perspective. You really need, you really need a, sens a sensitivity reader. And the third one is usually if you are touching on a very sensitive subject. This happens, I think, a lot in like, historical fiction uh, when you are touching on things like maybe like the civil rights movement, you're doing some sort of fantastical retelling of that, or if you're touching on um, very historic, very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Very painful moments or memories in certain communities' histories, you definitely, you definitely need a sensitivity reader. But I personally believe that as an author, if you are writing, if you're writing your work and something feels off and you start questioning whether you are accurately portraying um, a character who has a very different lived experience than you, then you probably also need a sensitivity reader. So there are times to just go with your gut. There's a lot of interesting facets that you brought up. Um, not just that if something feels weird, it probably is weird, um, but also specifically when dealing with like historical fiction, things like that, um, that's important for people to keep in mind. Um, Emeline, did you want to add? Uh, yes, actually. Um, I, this might be an extreme point of view, but I think that unless what you're writing is a memoir, you need a sensitivity reader, period. <laughs> um, unless you're writing about your life, you need a sensitivity reader. Um, I, think, I think a lot of us, you know, as Natasha said, we we are aware that we have some for lack of a better term blind spots when it comes to sensitivity and something could feel off but more often than not someone writes something that is culturally insensitive or historically inaccurate and they don't feel off at all they don't they're not even aware that they have this this lack of perspective and i think that unless you're writing about yourself and your life and your personal experiences from your own point of view, there's, there's just no way that you can get it correctly because we, you, we can have people, two people that are, have, they have very similar experiences and the, the areas where their intersections might converge could be a huge um, area in which to get something wrong and be very, very harmful to a particular group. So yeah, unless it's about you and all about you, get a sensitivity reader, sorry. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful perspective to bring. Um, that is something important to consider that it's so easy to get things wrong without even knowing about it. Mm -hmm. Dan, when did you realize you needed a sensitivity reader? Um, well, I for the first book, uh, so in the first book I have a couple of characters, a couple of queer characters but the story is really very much kind of a driving adventure and there's not, there's not a lot of stuff about um, their identities or relationships or anything. So I had a few beta readers who, you know, get, take a look and, you know, to make sure nothing was really off, but I felt fairly comfortable. You know, I have a lot of family and friends and students who are queer. So I felt like I could handle the, um, you know, the minor, what you call casual representation. Okay. But when it came to the second book, I drafted it and edited it a few times, and <clears throat> there was just a lot more going on than in the first book. There were relationships, um, you know, romance arcs, a lot of other stuff. And even though I still did have some, you know, beta readers who were helping me, I said at a certain point, you know, you can't just ask a couple of, you know, friends to, you know, really get in depth on it. And I started to feel like, you know, what I'm, I'm really going to screw something up, so I need to reach out. Uh, so I reached out via Twitter and, you know, to a couple of agencies I knew. 
And I was also very inspired by a particular blog post that I read, uh, which said the, the title of the post is something like, um, does a protagonist queer identity matter? And was written by a certain Arena Nabe, who's a fabulous blogger and sensitivity reader. Anyway, I read that post uh, and about how important it was to her to read about characters who are queer and not just, you know, about struggles and, you know, tragedy, but just normal people living normal lives. And I was like, wow, this is such a great post. And I read it a bunch of times and I was like, oh crap, what if what I write is going to be hurting, you know, somebody like her, uh, somebody like my sisters and my nieces and nephews and all the people I know. So after I reached out on Twitter, I had the incredible good fortune that she reached out to me and said, hey, I'm, I do sensitivity reading too, would you be interested? So that's how I ended up working with her. What a phenomenal happenstance. Indeed. And it's, you brought up an interesting point about measuring your own knowledge against the depth and the breadth of what you were working on. Um, and I think that's important for a lot of authors to realize when they know enough and when they stop knowing enough. Um, so the next question, um, how do you find a sensitivity reader? Um, I've worked with other authors before, um, and I've suggested sensitivity services. Um, where does an interested person find one? Dan mentioned reaching out on Twitter, um, but if you don't have the right connections, it can be hard to be heard. Um, so Natasha, did you want to start? Um, sure. Um, so I agree with Daniel about reaching out on Twitter because if memory serves me correctly, I even have sensitivity reader in my like Twitter bio. So if you search it, like me and other people who have that in our bio, it would, it would appear. Um, I also would recommend using any network, connect, any connections you have. So for example, me, when I got into the writing industry, I started by going to like a lot of conventions and you build up connections that way. And so like one author worked with a sensitivity reader and so they'll recommend that reader to you and things like that. Additionally, there is, I cannot remember their name now, but there are smaller like sensitivity reader groups online or smaller like, organizations that they offer a lot of different writing services. I, I really wish I could remember this one group's name, but I can't. <laughs> they offer like editing and proofreading services, but then they all also offer sensitivity reading. So I would recommend trying to follow groups like that on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever. Uh, I also think this isn't, maybe you all can actually tell me about this. I don't think this is as common with traditional, with bigger traditionally pub, uh, traditional publishing houses, but I know that I or I hope to believe that some publishing houses have a list of sensitivity readers or kind of back call when they when they need them. So maybe looking at some publishing houses too to see who they have worked with and kind of going from there. Um, those sound like some excellent resources. I don't have an answer for you about the publishing houses, but maybe someone else, maybe someone in the audience or someone <laughs> here in the panel will be able to give us an answer. Um, Dan, you said you found your uh, sensitivity reader on Twitter, but did you look other places? Uh, are you no, uh, no. For me, Twitter is uh, kind of the beginning of end end of uh, <laughs> writing. Uh, well, it's true. I mean, because no matter what you want to know, you're going to find somebody there. So I already was in contact. So I know of two pretty well known and respected uh, entities that uh, that do sensitivity reading. Um, one is Salt and Sage, another is Quiet House, and several people recommended one or the other. Um, and I, I see them both on Twitter sometimes. But in addition, when I put out the call, a whole bunch of people reached out. And the problem was, frankly, that there were too many incredibly qualified people who reached out and said, you know, because I had put a whole list of, you know, what representation was in the book. And, you know, so many people reached out and I, it was an embarrassment of riches. I just, I had a hard time choosing until Arena reached out and the person who made me feel like I wanted to get a sense of to begin with, you know, the discussion was over. But I had to tell like two or three incredibly qualified, excellent, thoughtful people, you know, sorry, no. That really is the hard part when you know, like you have so many excellent people that you could work with and you really only can work with one or at least one at a time. Um, and you gave us some good names for people to look up, which is great. Um, em? Well, I'm my really good friend, Google. <laughs> you can um, say that, that's an answer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but all jokes aside, Twitter is a great arena. But as Dan said, you put out a call on Twitter for literally anything writing related. The writing community is really strong. 
and very vocal on Twitter and very, very supportive. None of these are bad things, but when you put out a call for anything, you're going to get so much feedback that it can be overwhelming. I absolutely think that um, Googling is really great because not only can you see reputable sensitivity readers, but you can also see where their areas of sensitivity and expertise are. Um, I do think Twitter is great though, if you're looking for a very specific niche or if you want to give someone who's a bit less well-known or less reputable or working independently a chance to be your sensitivity reader, um, I think oftentimes um, certain groups are overlooked because we want the best person for the job, right? So we want to go with what's most well-known and what's most popular. But I do think that there, there are lots of great sensitivity readers who are working independently or working freelance that you know are just out there um, you know, ready to do an excellent job. So um, that's why I say Google and, you know, it, if worse comes to worse, ask around. That way you can sort of like go through the candidates and pick and choose long before they're where you need one so that you can disappoint as few people as possible. <laughs> So you don't end up in Dan's position where he has all these lovely people. <laughs> like, sorry, bye. <laughs> uh, Jennifer. Uh, people have found me on Twitter. That's the only connection <laughs> I have is through Twitter. Um, sometimes people will specifically ask for a sensitivity reader, or sometimes my friends just contact me and say, my friend's writing this book. Do you have time to look at this character or something and I wouldn't know how to do anything re writing related outside of Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that Twitter is the place to be. <laughs> yes. That no. seems to be the overwhelming piece of information here. Um, so once you're on Twitter or using Google and looking for a sensitivity reader, how do you vet a sensitivity reader? What are the signs of somebody who knows what they're talking about? Um, when you're looking at um, someone's web page or someone's Twitter feed, how do you figure out if, you, if this person not only will be right for your, the representation you're looking for, but skill-wise? Um, what are the green lights? What are the red flags? Um, and did you want to start this time? Sure. Um, personally, what I look for and what I, I try to represent as a sensitivity reader is clarity. You want to be able to, to contact that person or go to that person's website and be able to see very clearly, you know, what they do, why they do it, and what their areas of sensitivity are. And if it's not clarified on their webpage, you know, after an email conversation with them, it should be clarified. I feel that usually a red flag when it comes to sensitivity readers is someone who isn't very clear. If there's any area of ambiguity, like there, there, there are certain gray areas or things that they haven't clarified, that's a that's an instant turn off for me. That makes sense because if they're not being clear about it, you really don't know what you're going to get back from them, right? Exactly. So that makes sense, exactly. Jennifer. Oh. <clears throat> well, what Emmy was just saying is that um, like clarity is. Also, specificity. Like, I would not claim to be any sort of expert in all disability. I can tell you, hey, that sounds like something that could insult people with this disability, but I would specify, like, I am disabled, but I have spinal muscular atrophy. I use a wheelchair. I can refer you to someone else for this part, but I am not the person to ask that they don't claim to be the answer for everything. If they admit that they don't know things, it seems like that helps. That makes sense to me because we, as we discussed before, as writers, we can only really cover our own experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And even the same two people with my same disability will have different um, experiences with it, different levels of severity or the way it affects their life. So saying that this is only my opinion instead of this is the answer. 
And M, you brought that up a little bit earlier regarding um, where people's experiences intersect and how they can have different answers to the same question because of it. Um, right. It wasn't until I got on Twitter, actually, that specifically where disability is concerned that, you know, as a Black woman and an immigrant, I think about intersections very, very um, often. But it had honestly never crossed my mind that the experiences of um you know, people of color who are disabled or white people who are disabled might be different. And that race plays a huge factor in even that one small thing. So again, the thing that you don't know that you don't know, as I brought up earlier, I don't even know that this is a huge blind spot, but thinking about these things, and as Jennifer said, admitting that you don't know something, you might have an inkling, um, or you might just not know altogether, and telling that person, hey, I may not be the best person for this job or this portion of the work. And that level of transparency, I think, is a mark of a good sensitivity reader. That is excellent to consider. Dan, what made you realize that you were working with a great sensitivity reader? Because you say she's awesome. So tell us all about her and why she is. Yes. Um, well, I think the first thing is from the moment that I first got the email, you know, so she said, hey, would you want to work together? We back and forth a little bit. I described what what the book was about and what my concerns were, what my thoughts were, but she put me at ease immediately. And obviously the, it's not that, you know, the main job is not to put you at ease, but if as a writer, you don't feel comfortable, you know, showing your ignorance and vulnerability about certain things, then you're not gonna have a productive relationship. So as a sensitivity reader, you know, one of the people that reached out to me who was super qualified did not put me at ease, sort of made me feel, you know, belittled and, maybe a little bit stupid. And so I, I didn't feel like I wanted to work with that person just because their tone came off as very authoritative. And, and obviously you want a sensitivity to be authoritative, but you also have to have a good working relationship. And so, you know, feeling comfortable with the way the communication happens is part of it. And also, as was mentioned before, that the specificity is key. So, you know, uh, she was able to say like, you know, these are the particular things I have knowledge of. And other areas that might be tangential, you know, she's, she can say, I can give you some suggestions, but, you know, knowing that there are certain areas that, that she has, you know, direct experience of and her willingness to say, you know, this other area I don't have direct experience of, but, you know, here's my take. Um, those are things that made a big difference. And also just the way that, that she writes. I feel like uh, you read someone's writing and you can tell about the way they think. And so, I, I knew from having read her, you know, her blog posts, a, a number of other blog posts too, that, that I liked the way she thought and that there's some similarities there. So those are the main things for me. You want to be able to be wrong. Um, yeah, right? actually, yeah, I want to add something. Um, I listened to a podcast last year um, about what you should know going into working with sensitivity reader. And the biggest takeaway was be prepared to be wrong about some stuff and don't like, don't get all offended when you realize you're wrong and you were ignorant and there's something you didn't know. Like that's a normal part of the human condition. That's part of writing. And so going into it thinking, I'm going to be wrong about some stuff. I'm going to have gotten some things wrong and I, that's okay. I'm just going to work to fix them. That's why we're here. It's nothing to panic about. You know, it's part of the process. That's why the process exists. Which is excellent advice for anyone using sensitivity there. But as you mentioned, the sensitivity reader giving you that space to be wrong without it being insulting is probably kind of a huge deal too. Um, Natasha. Yeah, sure. So just re-echoing a lot of what has already been said um, about a sensitivity reader admitting when like this, this part of the novel or this perspective I can't fulfill. For me, for example, um, obviously I'm a black woman, so a lot of sensitivity reading I do is about being a black woman or being um, an African American. That being said, I don't think that I could do a proper sensitivity reading if it focused on a black character who was like raised by white parents, for example, because that's not my experience. Just to um, kind of reiterate what everyone has been saying. I also kind of just general, I, I like reading testimonials and reviews um, on a on a sensitivity reader's platform. This is some advice that I need to take because <laughs> I only have a few reviews, but I should put more, but you know, take my own advice later. So reading testimonials and reviews and everything like that. I would also look at their process. I know a lot of um, editors and like book reviewers do this where they have a page on their website dedicated to just explain how their process works. If they read it once or do they read it twice? And if they are going to give you a, if they are going to give um, an author more of a yes, yes, you, I think you should do this. No, I don't think you should do that. 
that's not that's may not be the best idea or are they also going to add some context to it is it going to actually be a learning moment you know um for me i just finished a sensitivity reading with an author who i actually have a call scheduled for i think next week sometime but i finished a sensitivity reading with her and it was a case where kind of what has been said here very sweet woman she has actually worked a lot in the in, um black and brown communities but the book she wrote it just it had a lot of issues like things that i don't think like i'm very certain she was not thinking about when she when she um, wrote them but when i would leave comments in her manuscript i really tried to say this is why it's not like this is why this isn't the best um option in my opinion and i also offer the opportunity like if you want to get on the phone and we can talk it out a bit more so nothing is misconstrued and i'm very clear we can do that so yeah you bring up an important point like it's not just that people don't know, but people don't have the context to understand. You can mm -hmm. tell someone that something doesn't work or that something might be hurtful, um, but is the sensitivity reader willing to go the extra mile and explain why? Um, and mm -hmm. you said to look like on their page where they explain their process, if they have one, and maybe there'll be some information there about that. We're just about at the halfway point and someone has asked a question um, that ties in with a question that I was going to ask. Um, so, this is um, Arena, I think it is. Um, please forgive me if I'm butchering your name. Um, one of the things that she asked, there's actually two kind of questions in here. When you're writing outside your own identity, how do you manage financial restrictions when hiring a sensitivity reader? Um, and one of my questions was, um, how does budgeting work when you're hiring a sensitivity reader? Um, do you charge per page? Do you charge per chapter? Do you charge per word? Um, can you give us some insight onto how those things work um, so that people can be prepared when they're approaching other sensitivity readers with work? Um, Dan, we haven't picked on you first yet. Do you want to tell us how the process <laughs> works for you? Uh, well, my experience is that every sensitivity reader has different, you know, different rates and are usually pretty clear it's, you know, by the word or by the whatever. And a lot of them also will say, you know, I'll work, you know, I'll, I'll be willing to work with your budget. A lot of sensitivity readers are, are sensitive to the fact that not everybody has the same privilege. So like, you know, I'm in a fairly comfortable situation. So hiring a sensitivity reader would not be, you know, a major financial setback. But if you're a writer who's, you know, who's, you know, barely struggling, you know, struggling to get by, then that would be challenging. And I will say that I saw a lot of references to, you know, I'm willing to work within your budget uh, on a lot of the pages of sensitivity readers I looked into. That's good information to have. So people shouldn't be afraid to approach sensitivity readers and ask them about it. Right. I would also say that there's, I've lost my train of thought. I'll come back. <laughs> That's okay. Speak up whenever you find it. Um, Natasha? Um, hmm. Yeah. So I would say one, kind of like going off what Dan said, people are not, not even just in theory, but like any sort of free, any sort of freelance editor um, in my experience as well, they are willing to work with in an author's budget. So if you cannot pay in one lump sum, okay, just, give it to, you know, pay in two or three installments instead. Um, I, but going off of that, I will say that I think if someone is looking to write professionally, they, when they're setting up their budget for a book or a relaunch or whatever, they do need to consider sensitivity reading and their budget before they even connect to the sensitivity readers um, so that that money is put aside. Just, if you know your book is likely to need a sensitivity reader, if you have that gut feeling or you know, you, it falls into one of the three scenarios that I described previously, just go ahead and set money aside for it. And in my opinion, the money pays off in the long run because I, I guess I, the best way to say is like, it saves you from any like PR nightmare or any Twitter drags. <laughs> so like, it's just, just like, do it, just do it now, you know, and get it out the way and um, grow from there. <laughs> And you can feel confident, right? Once you've mm -hmm. had a sensitivity reader help you work on your book, you can promote it more confidently. Mm -hmm. um, you never have to worry about, oh no, I thought about hiring a sensitivity reader and then I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, making it part of the initial budget. Excellent idea. Um, Jennifer. When I've done sensitivity, <laughs> sensitivity reading, I've always basically said whatever you can afford and think it's worth. Because this is so not, my main job in writing it's kind of like a hobby and if it's a book i would want to read anyway it's kind of like i get to read it for free and i get to help there be more better representation in the world 
This is awesome. Like, so you're saying we can game the system. <laughs> <laughs> I am yes, joking. Actually, yeah. A book that my friend was writing, I noticed in her um, blurb about the book that there was um, a phrase that could have been phrased more sensitively, and I let her know. I said, do you want to read the whole book? I said, yeah. Like, I kind of wanted to read it anyway, so yeah. <laughs> I'm probably not the best person to ask, because I'll do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to veto you. Um, pay people for their work. Don't, don't do what Jennifer says. <laughs> um, Dan, you said you remember the... <laughs> Good. Good. Dan, you said you remembered what you were going to say. Uh, yeah, so before I work with the sensitivity reader, um, I had, there's a lot of people on, guess where, Twitter, um, who are very happy to answer questions. So for example, before I was ever on Twitter, I had never met a person who was openly asexual. I didn't really know what it meant. And the number of asexuals on Twitter who were like, hey, you want to know something about asexuality? Like, ask me anything. Um, was incredible. And so like, I, I asked a whole bunch of questions and got a lot of thoughtful answers and, and sort of built up a lot of knowledge that way. Uh, and a number of people all said, hey, if you want you know, me to you know, help you read a passage to see if like, it sounds okay. You know, it's not to say that it's the same thing as a, as a set full sensitivity read, but especially if you're a beginning author and you know, if you build connections within the communities on Twitter, you are able to at least get some feedback, especially at an early stage. Maybe you don't have that budget now, but you're, you're working toward it you know, to at least get a sense whether you know, in the long run, you're gonna need to hire a sensitivity reader. Um, I found a lot of people very generous uh, on Twitter. And again, it's not, it's not a replacement for a sensitivity reader, but it is a resource people can use, especially in the early stages of their writing. Yeah, um, you bring up a good point in that asking those questions can help you draft the book that later needs a sensitivity reader. Um, but without those answers, you might not even get that far. Um, so just asking people is not a terrible thing. M. Um, well, I have a few solutions. Um, personally, I charge per word, like for every blank mm -hmm. thousand words, I feel like it's the fairest way to charge mm -hmm. because some chapters are short and some chapters are long, right? So I feel like that's the fairest way overall. However, I do provide copy editing as well as line editing and proofreading services. So mm -hmm. one of the ways um, I make it easier for my clients is if they want both of these things, they want me to edit for them as well as sensitivity read i'll reduce the rates of both um you know they'll, they'll sign both contracts i'll reduce the rates of both and instead of paying in two installments which is an option i give for sensitivity read i will allow them to pay in three or four installments for the combination of you know two or more services um, another thing is that i also offer beta reading at a drastically reduced price and like Jennifer, I'm someone who uh, has a tendency to beta read for, for highly reduced or free <laughs> if it's some material that I would want to read anyway. And so I'm not going to go line by line and explain to you an area of insensitivity um, or inaccuracy like I would with your traditional sensitivity read. But if I'm beta reading and I'm giving you my feedback, I'm gonna tell you FYI, this scenario or this individual in the way they were written is not it's not the way if it's not conducive to this community it's going to be a problem later um and then you know like natasha said get your coins together <laughs> and get a sensitivity <laughs> reader um beta reading you mentioned specifically um if somebody's on the fence about needing one and they're not quite sure if they want to commit the coin um get a beta reader find out their um their feelings on it. If somebody else tells you to get one, you should probably get one. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, with beta reading, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of frown on folks doing beta reading for free. Personally, I charge on my site. However, um, what, what authors have to understand is there are a lot of people who just read voraciously and love to read. I've always been one of these people. And beta reading provides an opportunity for many people to read um, new material, often long before it's published. And so they will gladly do it for free. You're not taking advantage of their time. And if you can find someone who reads and reads a variety of literature um, 
and they want to be your beta reader and they can do it for free or a reduced rate, take advantage of that if you are on the fence about getting a sensitivity read. Um, as someone who also does beta reading and editing services, I cannot agree more. Um, if I um, like the author and their work, uh, <laughs> I will make time. <laughs> um, so you are the farthest thing from wrong. Um, the other half of Arena's question was um, that sometimes there are a myriad of experiences within a single identity. Um, when you're working with someone whose experiences intersect, um, what are your, um, what would you suggest to someone writing a character like this who maybe can't find a beta reader who's an exact match? Um, well, who's might not pick them first? Natasha, let's go first. Okay, sure. So you're, um, just to make sure I understand, so your question is if you have a character who's like intersects in various communities, um, how do you pick which sort of sensitivity reader or beta reader um, a, or beta reader from that community to um, approach? Is that your question? Yeah, um, how do you balance that? Who do you talk to? Like, do you go to multiple sensitivity readers? Do you try to find the closest match? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Um, so I would first suggest trying to find the closest quality match, right? Because you do want a sensitivity reader who's going to give you good feedback. That being said, I understand that it can be difficult to get someone who exactly matches. Um, if you have a character, for example, who's like, uh, who's a believer, believer in Islam, and they're also dis disabled, but they're also a member of the LGBTQ, that could be hard. That, For an example, that could be hard to find. Um, so I would suggest trying to get as close to that as possible. My other piece of advice would be what aspect of the character's identity is going to be at, is going to be at the forefront the most in the story? Um, or is the character more accepting of their sexuality, but confused about their religion? If so, then you probably need to focus on the religious aspect more. Is the character going to be um, the only character of, its, of, its, of his or her racial background um, in the text? If so, you might want to focus on that more so get a sensitivity reader from that community. So that's how I would do that, but I also understand that that can be difficult. But it definitely sounds like a good place to start by parsing out what are the most important pieces that affect the work. I think that's great mm -hmm. advice. Jennifer? I would do what Natasha said, but also um, for the other identities that you don't have a sensitivity reader for, you just ask questions of people with that identity to make sure like, you're not overlooking anything in those areas too. That's true. Just because you're not hiring a person to do it doesn't absolve you from doing research. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. M? Yeah, I agree with both Natasha and Jennifer. And piggybacking on Jennifer's point, I see that oftentimes um, with authors um, or writers, and I'm not exempt from this either, often the areas where they will be the most culturally insensitive or historically inaccurate are the areas where they are projecting upon a community rather than researching and learning. So yeah, if you do if you do study and you do research, you're much less likely to make a mistake. I would also say, you know, as Natasha said, get your best quality match, a person that comes closest to having all of the identities in their um, specific list of sensitivity topics. However, if you can't find that and you can't afford more than one or maybe two sensitivity readers, I think the next best option is to put out a call for beta readers from the other communities because um, beta readers from that from the other groups will inevitably tell you if you're messing up mm -hmm. <laughs> they will inevitably like uh no no we don't pray seven times a day we pray five times a day <laughs> yeah i'm 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 very busy erica oh okay okay thank you so yeah, um, if you just if you just get the right community, um, and you, I don't want to say I don't want to say become a part of that community because I don't want anyone to start just taking up random space in communities, but mm -hmm. um, social media is a great place to just watch people interact. You don't have to enter a space or put your two cents in to watch how a community interacts with each other and what isn't isn't important to them because those issues will inevitably become highlighted over and over and over again. 
Um, definitely. One of the things that I had recommended to me was to um, follow educators um, on Twitter and just listen. Um, follow people, um, follow um, sensitivity readers and people who do beta reading and just listen to what they say because you never know um, when you'll learn something about something you might use down the road. Um, but you're right, just because you are gifted with information doesn't mean you have to take up space in that discussion. Dan, have you faced this problem in your work? Um, do you plan to face this problem in your work? What tactics are you thinking of using? Uh, for me, so I had a, the book that I ended up writing had a lot of different uh, identities in it. And uh, frankly, I was a bit overwhelmed, but I, I noticed that there were some that I was very comfortable with and some that I didn't know as much about. So when I was looking for a sensitivity reader, I was particularly looking for somebody who had knowledge of um, asexuality and non-binary experience. So like, for example, there's a gay couple in the book, uh, two men, and it was just a simple, you know, relationship romance. There's nothing really, you know, particularly different or strange. It's in a fantasy society where there's not really stigma. So I didn't feel like I needed, you know, much help with that because it's just two people having a relationship. But when I'm writing a character, you know, who's who's non-binary, and again, I've, you know, listened as uh, I think M said on Twitter to people talking about it and read. I just don't have the experience to know enough. Um, and also with asexuality, I, I don't have the experience. And so when I had situations where their character is going to have you know conversations that may you know touch on their identity uh, or a relationship that's where the people in the relationship are of an identity that I, I don't know much about, that's when I really feel like I needed somebody. So those looking for a sensitivity reader that has knowledge in, in the areas where your representation is deeper, but you don't necessarily need to have them, like if you just show like a gay couple walking down the street in passing, obviously you don't need a sensitivity mm -hmm. for that. So figuring out where the representation is casual and where it's deeper and focusing on a sensitivity reader for the deeper aspects. And you may be able to, you know, you may not need one for every single uh, identity that's just casually in the book, but it's not a big uh, part of the plot or, you know what I mean? Identifying the specific weaknesses in the work itself, like your own blind spots and the parts that you're unsure of can help you figure out what kind of sensitivity reader you need. I think that's great advice. If I, can I add one more thing? Sorry. Always. <laughs> um, so one thing I was going to add is, um, of, as the, as the question stated, if you have a character or characters who are from intersecting backgrounds and everything, they're, um, hiring a sensitivity reader does not mean that you shouldn't research as, they, as has already been stated. I do also want to reiterate, which I think everyone knows this, but I want to also just kind of double down on this, that research is, re, researching a community is still not as good as having a sensitivity reader from that community. So you need to do, I would recommend definitely doing both. And that leads me into my second point, which is that if you publish a book and you hired a sensitivity reader, if you've done all the research, that does not excuse you from criticism from that community. Um, and I, not to go into a story, but an author friend I had who just something happened in his book, he's like, oh crap, and he got criticism for it. But when he got that criticism, and I know it can be hard in this year that is 2020 because there's a lot of tension and things going on right now for everyone, um, but it, oh, words. It's hard in the, this year that is 2020, but the best thing I would advise to do in that situation is take it in, read it, see how you feel about it, talk to your sensitivity reader about it, but do not lash out or do not immediately get defensive. And again, it's 2020, it's a really rough year for everyone. And Twitter can be, Twitter is great, but uh, myself included, I can, people can lose their um, temper on Twitter. And so, if you get backlash, just accept it. Getting a sensitivity does not make, make you immune from any sort of criticism. That was not well spoken, but yeah. <laughs> um, I actually have that in my contract. Like, this is it. I'm not making you free of criticism. <laughs> and this is also not like an endorsement of your work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, but uh, a piggybacking on something that um, Natasha just said, I do think it's important to have sensitivity readers. Sensitivity readers do not we put research does not replace sensitivity readers. Mm -hmm. But I also think a question that most writers um, need to start ask, asking themselves, especially in 2020, is why did I create this character? I feel like so many um, writers now 
are just rushing to create characters that are as diverse as possible and tick as many diversity boxes as possible. I'm gonna make him like Orthodox Jew and gay and disabled and like he's adopted and his biological parents are Arab and he's being raised in the Caribbean. <laughs> like who wrote this and why did you write this? You know, it's one thing to to want your work to represent people out in the world. It's another thing altogether to want to give yourself diversity pats on the back or ally cookies for mm -hmm. including certain groups in your work. They're perfectly fine authors who to this day their work still holds up who've only ever written about people that they are or people that they have encountered in their lives, you know? And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there's nothing wrong with having work that doesn't necessarily include every single community that exists. Um, mm -hmm. You want your work to be realistic of life, but um, you know, as a sensitivity reader, I understand that everyone else's lived experiences can be largely far, far, far less diverse than my own. Um, I, I, for me, I would rather read about <laughs> uh, an author, for instance, who writes about an all white community where everyone's able bodied than to have someone who includes various communities of color but gets everything wrong, includes disabled people but gets everything wrong, includes queer people but gets everything wrong. And all these characters are just living stereotypes. Mm -hmm. to, I'm sorry, okay. Oh, keep going. Sorry. No, I was gonna, I, I promise I'm gonna let us go continue, sorry. Just to add to that, I saw this on Twitter of all places and it made sense to me. Um, writing a diverse story is not the same as writing another person's story. So there are lots of authors who have characters who are diver diverse in various ways, whether it's ability, country, language, and things like that. Um, but they are not necessarily writing the stories of people outside of their community. And that's a choice that every author has to make, obviously. But just know that in order for your story to be diverse, you do not have to be writing um, from the perspective of a black gay man or from the perspective right. of a um, of a black woman in a wheel in a wheelchair. You know, you can have them as just characters in the story. But again, that is a decision that each author has to make. So, mm -hmm. okay, sorry, continue. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. My my only struggle is that you've brought up so many good points that I don't know where to start addressing them. Um, no, um, so I'm not gonna. Right. Oh, really quickly, I wanted to touch on something that Tasha just said because she reminded me of one of my favorite children's authors, Kimberly Willis Holt, and she published a book many decades ago called My Louisiana Sky, and the book is set in a small all white community in Louisiana, and our protagonist is. Um, living in a home with her grandmother, who's her primary caretaker, and her parents, both of whom have um, disabilities. Uh, the father is dyslexic. Yeah, uh, I think... Emmy, I think can you disappeared. Can you hear me now? You have returned. <laughs> yes. What is the last thing you heard? <laughs> what is the last thing everyone heard? I don't know where you stopped hearing me. I'm sorry. The father had dyslexia. Yes, the father had dyslexia. And this is in the 60s where dyslexia is not recognized as like dyslexia. Um, they just called him quote unquote slow. And the mother had a traumatic brain injury as a child that has made her, um, give, given her delayed cognitive abilities. And they are also poor. Um, so the father's, you know, comes from working class family, but the family's more or less poor or a very, very lower middle class. And so there's a lot of diverse, diversity in just that sphere, even though there's really no one outside of the family or outside of the community to speak of. Um, and so, you know, like Natasha said, you can make your work very, very diverse. Even if you just stick to one um, larger community, you can have a diversity in the subgroups. That's something that's really important to consider that I don't know that a lot of people think about. There's so many different ways to show, like, the diversity of people within people. Um, 
we are running low on time. Um, Arena has another question. Um, so this is prefaced by saying that the question might be a little bit personal, so um, you don't have to answer it. Um, but the question is, is sensitivity reading something you see as an exploration of your own identity in some ways, um, or for you to under help understand your own experiences? Um, so you, if I ask and you don't have an answer, you can just say no answer. Um, that's totally cool. We're not gonna, this is not school. You're not being marked. Um, Dan, you're kind of disqualified from this one. <laughs> he doesn't seem super heartbroken about it. <laughs> um, Jennifer, did you want? I don't think I have a good answer for it because I don't really see it that way. I just see it as trying to help not, you know, perpetuate stereotypes and harmful representation. That's why I do it. That's still a perfectly good answer. That answers the question fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, M, did you want to, did you have a, a response to it? Yes. Um, in my case, I absolutely see sensitivity reading as, an, you know, exploring my own identities. Because it's like we said earlier, you know, the writers don't know everything, but sensitivity readers don't either. Even the areas or the topics that are, are areas of expertise, so to speak, um, I feel like an identity is not a stagnant thing. You're always growing and you're always learning in your identity. And sometimes, even when I'm looking at someone else's work and I'm seeing areas of insensitivity, I'm also seeing my own personal bias. Um, just because I'm a Black woman or just because I'm an immigrant or well, just because I'm you know, someone who deals with mental illness doesn't mean that I'm immune from um, classism or various other forms of respectability politics. Um, mm -hmm. It does not make me immune from any type of elitism. Uh, it doesn't make me immune potentially from xenophobia, you know? Um, just because you're a part of the queer community doesn't mean that you don't have isms towards other members of that community, right? So mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes when you're sensitivity reading, it can be a mirror to yourself about areas that where you have um, subconscious or unconscious biases. We lost you again. I wrong. What are my blind spots? <laughs> we did lose you for a minute there. Oh, not again. What's the last thing you heard me say? <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about your own unconscious bias. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's not just about reading this person's work and being like, that's wrong. That's incorrect. That's insensitive. You have to hold the mirror to yourself. You know, where am I wrong? Where do I need to grow? Um, and I think the more you grow, the, the better job you can do. And every single client and every single new piece of material that I have to read allows me the, that opportunity for growth. I can see certain biases, certain prejudices, um, even personal insecurities can be revealed mm -hmm. to you during the process of sensitivity reading. That is a very thoughtful answer, um, even though your technology has conspired against you. <laughs> There's a um, thunderstorm that's been raining all week. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm honestly surprised I have internet connection today. Um, we're just grateful for your patience um, and for you repeating yourself because we really do want to hear your answer. Um, Natasha, did you have an answer to the question? Um, I pretty much second what Emmy said. Um, yeah, it is like holding up a mirror and having to confront, confront yourself about certain things. And just like with editing, you have to, so there is a certain level of objectivity that has to be held in sensitivity reading and I've definitely read manuscripts before where I go back and I read a scene and I might say okay so what about this scene is actually bothering me is it something very personal very is it something very very personal to me or is it contributing to a larger stereotype or a larger stereoty uh, stereotypical theme in the text and I need to kind of be objective and separate and kind of separate myself to a certain extent um it also I'm trying to think of a good, I'm trying to think of a good example. So one big thing for me, and I'm going to keep this short because I know we're running out of time. Uh, one big thing for me is like reading 
uh, stories, and I, I love the story, and then like an author will introduce the first black character, and the character is nothing but stereotypes. I've had that happen, and it's just like, it's like, oh God, why? <laughs> it's like, it's like, I was really, really enjoying this book, and then that kind of happened. And, but I've also had conversations with myself where I say, hmm, well, Tasha, you know, you, people say, you, I speak very properly, or other terms they use, whatever. I speak very properly, but there are black people who don't speak this way. So is it necessarily problematic that the author um, introduced this character and this character is speaking in like a lot of um, Ebonics or um, they are using a lot of slang? Is that problematic or is it more so problematic that this is the only black representation in the story? And I've had conversations like that with myself and like called myself out on a few things. So I agree with um, everything Emmy said pretty much. There's always something to be said for the difference between something that is an issue for the community versus like an issue mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. Uh, and I can imagine that being, like you said, you have to constantly ask when you're doing a sensitivity reader, like what kind of problem is this and how is it addressed? Mm -hmm. um, so we are pretty much done on time. I'm gonna go through everybody one last time so you can um, say your thanks or add any last minute notes that you have for the um, panel. And we're gonna start with Dan because Dan was super excluded. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I really enjoyed listening. Uh, it's uh, part of the reason why I'm here. One final note, if you're a writer out there listening, a sensitivity reader does not write for you. They only help identify parts of your book that might need some work and give you suggestions. So like when my book comes out in December, you know, my sensitivity reader is going to see it for the first time uh, in its new form and hopefully it will, you know, please her. But ultimately, is I'm the one who's writing it. So if there's something problematic in there, and I'm just going to be here to listen and take the beating on Twitter. Uh, and it, hopefully, hopefully there won't be too much of that, but that's all you can do. Um, Jennifer. Um, thank you very much for letting me join this. Um, I don't have much else to add, except if you have questions about wheelchair using or being autistic or queer, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think most of our, um, most of everyone here is able, um, has their social stuff posted on the website or in the Discord. Um, so definitely check everyone out. Um, em? Yeah, um, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. It was lovely to meet everyone and listen to everyone's responses. And you can also find me on Twitter um, at please leave a message. <laughs> <laughs> What an excellent handle. That's funny. I was looking for you the other day. I was like, she's not on Twitter. How can that be? And now I see. <laughs> I'll put it here in the little chat box. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Now people can find you a little easier. Natasha? Right. Yeah, sure. Um, so like everyone said, thank you all for coming here. And thanks to the panelists for sharing our discussions. I think the um, only thing I'll leave before the uh, guest is there are, myth, there are myths about sensitivity readers. Don't listen to some of those myths, <laughs> such as like um, sensitivity reading is a form of censorship, which I've seen on Twitter before. Remember, it's to help, it's to avoid any sort of PR nightmare or Twitter storm. And you make the final decision um, on the suggestions, like Dan said, that your sensitivity reader gives you. So it's not a form of censorship. Really try to invest in sensitivity readers. And yeah, good, good luck on all your writing, everyone. I'm going to take one last second to thank Diana and thank the weeknight writers. Um, and I think that's just about wrap. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.